Glad to have you all here today, folks. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Everybody comfortable? Yep. Yep. Sunday school after morning worship, trustee meeting after Sunday school, new members meeting next Sunday at noon, that's after Sunday school, okay. Uh, ladies meeting is June 9th, again at 11 a.m. And the church picnic is August 19th for the 26th rain day. Let's see what we have here for prayer requests. Last week, uh, Barbara Snell's daughter, daughter's father-in-law has esophageal cancer. So that's a terrible thing. <laughs> Betsy Warmoth has a lump in her throat. And um, so she's going for another biopsy, the final test, Tuesday. And um, what I want to happen is they're going to say, you know what? That's just a lot of fluid in there. Um, there's nothing really to worry about. Forget it. Go on, enjoy your life. That's what we're praying for. Betty Warmoth has fluid issues, um, so we need to continue to pray for her. Her legs <coughs> swell terribly, and it's uh, quite uncomfortable. Jack Ayub, senior. He has knee and leg problems. They have to remove it. It looks, sounds like they have to take a stint out of his leg. There's a blood gonna, clot in there. They're going to shoot something in there to dissolve the clot. Try and dissolve the clot. So he's up at CMC. We need to keep him in prayer. Chancel Suski out on the West Coast is having a difficult time. We need to pray for him. Um, the familiar ones on, on the prayer list. Um, Tommy Gallivitz, we need to pray for strength for him. Youngstown, Ohio Church, that's Nathan Doyle's pastor. Missionary of the Week is San Juan, uh, San Juan, Juan Parr of Guatemala. And St. Juan Parr of Guatemala, let's put it that way. And uh, then the Senior of the Week is Agnes Skalka. I was talking to the, our pastor down in uh, St. Clair, uh, over conference, and uh, he knows Agnes. Does he? Yeah, he he's did. an elderly gentleman. Uh, he's 78. He's in trouble already. Because yeah, I said gentleman? <laughs> no, elderly. <laughs> elderly, 78. He's in trouble already. It's good to see everybody's awake this morning. <laughs> 90s are elderly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not 70s. 90s. When I was a kid, 54 was elderly. Yes. 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 Oh, my goodness. <laughs> my grandmother, I remember she, you know, she wore the house dress and she was a little Italian lady. Like, oh, I <laughs> wow. Grandpa died when he was 58, and it wasn't uh, horribly early, but some people are not elderly at 78 at all. <laughs> some are, let's just put it that way. Is there anything left that you can say without getting into trouble? <laughs> if you're young at heart. Uh, let's see, I think I can mention the Youngstown and Ohio Church, we did that. Does anybody have any, this all started because I tried to say something nice about Agnes Galka. <laughs> <laughs> She'll be thrilled to know you mentioned her name. It's hard to say that. Yeah, surely. Get my daughter, Kim, Kim Vail. She, she has um, shingles in her oh, eye. Yeah. Her head. Oh, oh. oh. Uh, I only do on that at room. Yeah. Yeah, that's not fun. No. I got it. I got my shot. 
Yeah. Anybody else? Jimmy. Jimmy. Yes. Jimmy. Yes, uh, Jimmy has to love it, Cheryl. Actually, Erin, his fiance. She's uh, actually 29 weeks pregnant, right? Yes. And the baby, there's something wrong with the amniotic fluid. It's not what it really should be. So they've got her down in Allentown, and they're going to keep her uh, until the baby's born. So we're looking at, you know, typically it could be uh, 11 weeks. But if the baby progresses, hopefully, you know, so we need to pray for this because uh, we've seen this before and we've seen unbelievable things happen. And uh, so she's getting great care and in a good place. And we all love her and we're praying for uh, Aaron and Jimmy and the baby. Anybody else? I have my heart test on Tuesday. Pardon? My heart test on Tuesday. Uh, Lisa has a heart test Tuesday. What's the matter? What's the matter? The valves are larger than they should be. That's because you have a big heart. I do have a big heart. <laughs> it's an enlarged heart? Mm -hmm. Enlarged valves, basically. Enlarged valves. An enlarged valve. Joel Suski had an enlarged heart. Yeah. Bigger than the average bear's heart. Mm -hmm. But your valve is all you got going? I hope. Okay. I don't know yet. Okay. Anybody else? All right, folks. Glad to have you all here today. Let us turn in our hymnals to 485.
flowing stream. <laughs> so, and then I'll read that first line. Women will read, will read the italicized lines. We'll do this antiphonally. As a dear Lord with flowing, flowing streams, streams, so my soul longs to you, O God. My, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When, when shall I come to behold my face, God? My, my tears have been my food day and night. While well, you stay me continually, where is your God? These things I remember as I can cover all my soul. How I went to the throne, and led them in the procession of the house of God. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? O oh, my God, for I shall again praise him. My God, my God. Thank you, baby. See you. Let's bow our heads. We'll have a word of prayer. Okay. Yeah. Lord, what a great day this is, and yet in so many ways it's a tragic day, <laughs> for the things we celebrate today are in many ways confusing and disorienting, because Lord, we love America, we love this country we live in, we will thank you forever for the privilege and the blessing of being a part of this great country and enjoying the freedoms we enjoy and the uh, just magnificent landscape and the people here and the spirit here. And this is where you've chosen to give us for a homeland. So Father, we will just thank you and worship you and praise you forever. We also think of the heroes that we've sung about already and uh, those are men and women, and in many cases, very, very young men and very young women who responded to the call of war and have gone and defended our freedoms and our way of life, and in many ways, things that they really did not understand or that we really do not understand, but yet the spirit of patriotism burns within us. And at the same time, Father, war is the most perhaps horrible thing in all of the universe, that we should go to war against other people uh, in situations where thousands die in a day leaving thousands of households without a dad, without a mom, without an uncle, without grandpa, without the loving family people that we've grown up with. And that is so tragic. And those that come back from war maimed, physically in many cases, having lost limbs or having been, had their lungs burned out by terrible things, <coughs> And then there are those that come back with the mental and emotional scars of war that leave them tortured and terrorized, in some cases, for the rest of their lives. And so, our Heavenly Father, we come before you today and ask you for help and for hope, for perhaps of all the days that we have in this world, uh, this is a day that calls for us to plead for you, for plead with you for salvation, to ask you to bring your light, your peace, your grace, your kingdom to bear upon this earth, where there'll be no more war, no rumor of war, where plowshares really do, or excuse me, uh, swords really do be, become beaten into plowshares and people flock to the kingdom of God and celebrate the mercy and grace of the eternal one. So our Father, would you please speak to us about all these things today? We would think today of those who are, again, have made the ultimate sacrifice. We think of their families, 
that you would bring them special comfort and peace in more than just words, but pour out your spirit upon them that they might find the great gift of eternal life and be set free from the things that just devastate this world. And likewise, for those who have sacrificed limb for our way of life, we ask your blessing upon them and their families who sacrifice along with them. Lord, we also have a regular prayer, prayer list here. And we have friends and family on this prayer list that we ask you to put your spirit, pour out your spirit upon each and every one. We ask for healing. Our Heavenly Father, again, thinking of Betsy back here. And we pray, our Heavenly Father, that when they do this biopsy on Tuesday, they might put all the results together and say, you know what? This is nothing we need to worry about. This is just a, uh, a gathering of fluid. Or this is just something that, you know, we're going to watch it, but there's no cancer there. So our Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd heal her and take care of her. We're thinking of Jack Iowa because he gets ready to go through very serious surgery. We ask you to take care of him and protect and watch over him. We also think of Aaron and this little child and Jimmy. The Lord, put your hand upon these folk. First of all, bring them comfort and peace. We're grateful that we live in a place where we can have this kind of observation and where we can have this kind of caretaking. And so, Father, we're praying that you would bring this child forth healthy and whole and that Aaron, Jimmy, and the child might live their days out in happiness and in peace and in joy and spend the rest of their lives saying, this is our miracle, baby. This is where God put his hand upon us and brought us grace and mercy. Our Heavenly Father, we have so many cases where we call for that and ask your help. We also think of our friends out in Youngstown, Ohio, and our friend uh, Nathan Doyle. We pray for that church, Lord, that folk might come to know you and love you and again find the key that opens every door and find that joy unspeakable and peace that passes all understanding that the world can never know but in Christ Jesus it's the order of the day and it's the key to the kingdom and it's assurance deep in the heart of man that the God who has created the heavens and the earth loves us has a place prepared for us will bring us to be with him one day and will never ever leave us or forsake us we pray for Juan Parr and his work in Guatemala. Again, the same thing, Lord. We're so grateful that you don't despise the day of small things, but you've taken a little conference like the Primitive Methodist Conference, just as you took the little nation of Israel, and you have used us to bring the gospel across the four corners of the earth. And we will thank you forever for that, Lord, and for the souls that have been saved. We pray many more. We pray for our friend Agnes Galka down there in St. Clair. We're grateful that you would have spared her to this day. We ask your deepest and richest blessing upon her, that you'd soothe, calm, and fill her with <coughs> your holy presence. And we pray for all our seniors, Lord, that likewise you might take care of them. We pray for the United States Armed Forces. We pray for the law enforcement agents up and down the line, first responders, and everyone who works together to make this a civil society how we thank you for each and every spirit of that order. Lord, we can pray all day and it be so worthy. We ask you to hear our prayers as we share our voices together using the words our Savior taught us and say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. <coughs> and now the fabulous Primitive Methodist Choir will sing for us. Yeah. 
that is not only a beautiful song beautifully delivered, but when I first started going to the Primitive Methodist Church in Johnson City, uh, it's one of the first songs that caught my attention. And uh, so thank you very much, it was beautiful. <coughs> Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this day and the blessings of it. And again, Lord, if we were ever, if we ever needed a reminder of how desperately we need salvation to come to this earth and the tragedy that is every day operating normal procedure down here, just, we're, we're used to things that desperately need to be changed. Our Heavenly Father, you are our only hope. But the good news is that you have promised us that not only have you gone to prepare a place for us, but you'll take us to be with you, not just for a couple weeks to recuperate, not just for a couple of weeks or months or even a year, so we'd have great memories and things to share for the rest of our existence. But you have promised us eternal life. And that eternal life starts right here in this world when we put our heart, when we put our faith in Christ. We are born again. The Spirit of God comes into our life. We are transformed from within. We are brought from darkness to light. We go from <coughs> no hope and without God in this world to having hope in a rock that can never, ever fail. Would you come and speak to us in Jesus' name? Amen. As I said, this is uh, really a bittersweet holiday. And uh, it puts me to mind of a recent project I had. Um, the driver's side door window. <coughs> in uh, my car, stopped going up and down. I heard something crack in there, I heard something give way, and I thought, ah, I, I knew this would happen. And uh, I've seen it happen in my aunt's car, I'd seen it happen in one of Beth's father's cars at one time, and uh, okay, so I did what I do when something like that happens. Go to YouTube. And I watch people go through the process of repairing something like that. And after you watch the video, uh, you know, four or five times, and there's a bunch of different videos on there, and uh, you see what's involved, and you decide whether or not you can do the job. And I thought, uh, I don't like getting in there. There's electric involved. There's clamping onto glass, which glass, as you know, can break. You don't want to get too tight, you don't want to get too loose, or else that's not going to work. Ah, <coughs> uh, what do I do? What do I do? Okay, I finally decide I'll do the project, right? <laughs> that's what you call confidence, right? <laughs> All right, get the part, right? And what the part is, it's called a window regulator. And it's a couple steel uh, stanchions, I'll call them, or bars, sort of, pressed steel bars, and there's cable that goes through it, and there's a pulley in the middle that plugs into a motor, and uh, it's quite a little apparatus. All right, so here we go. So, <coughs> I gotta take the panel off the door. That's a real pain, because it has these clips in it, these little plugs that clip in. They like to break. And once you break them, you know, you've got to get the right one and it can turn into a real headache. But okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to take my time and do it right. So I, the door panel pops off fairly easily. And inside that door panel, there's a seal wires and plugs. And inside that door panel, there's another steel panel. Some cars, they just have a plastic, like a thing that's glued on there. This has a steel panel thing on there. Okay, I knew that was coming. But, so I, thinking about what they said, I disconnect the plugs, start to take everything apart, and I get it all apart, and I can see, I get the 
the old broken frame thing out of there, the regulator, and, and I get the new regulator in, right? Even with drilling some new holes to make sure that I can bolt this thing in instead of just hop riveting it, which didn't look like it was going to do the job. I get it in. Start buttoning everything back up. Put the plugs back in. Put the steel panel back on. Uh, put the final plugs back in. Put the door inside panel back on. And lo and behold, I forgot to pull a wire out to plug into the window operator, the trunk, or the uh, lock operator. So I have to pop the panel off again. I do that. Bring out the wire, get it plugged in. Everything's ready to go. And the window works. But there's a warning sign in the dashboard that says, a door ajar, driver's door ajar. Well, I can live with that, who cares, right? But it's really annoying. And so, finally I'm thinking, what could have been wrong? And I'm watching on YouTube to find out what's wrong, and they're saying there's a sensor. Remember, they used to have a button that you could really see. Well, now the button's hidden inside the lock mechanism. And they go bad, and so on. I'm going to have to change that. That means taking the lock mechanism out. I mean, redoing the whole thing, taking everything apart again. But then get that lock mechanism, take that apart, put the proper part in it, then put it all back together. And I'm thinking, ah! I don't want it. It's time for a new car. <laughs> this is a this is a disaster. And mess the re but this is best fault. Because about a month ago, yeah, I saw this Lincoln that I really wanted, right? And I said, hey, why don't we get it this thing? No, we're not gonna get it. So it's all her fault. Right? That's what went through my mind. Right or wrong as it may be. And all right, I'm going to take it apart and I'm going to get that lock out of there. I'll disassemble the whole thing and I'll see how. Well, I start taking everything apart again. And lo and behold, I see a plug that was never plugged back in. It's hidden in behind this thing and it plugs into the lock. And I thought, maybe that never got plugged in or maybe I knocked it loose or maybe I just forgot to plug it in. I plugged it back in put everything back together. Real difficult to test whether or not your progress is okay. So finally I put it back together and go to start the car and the battery couldn't be deader. <laughs> and I had unplugged, I, I completely disconnected the battery so this wouldn't happen, right? I didn't just take the negative terminal off. I took the negative and positive. Find out the battery was probably dead anyways. So go down to Frank. 184 bucks for the new battery. But the driver's door window works. And there's no trunk, uh, no door ajar. Mm -hmm. And it still works weeks <laughs> later. And you know why? <laughs> because I went through the whole process over and over until I got it right. What's that have to do with today? If you ever needed evidence that God is taking us through the whole process of salvation, perhaps Memorial Day is one of the most striking of those evidences. Where we celebrate heroes who are the heroes we're celebrating? Today's actually for the fallen. That's what we're remembering. Remember, this used to be original decoration day, and you were to go to the graves of the fallen and spruce up their graves and remember them and perhaps put a flag or some type of marker there so that it would be known that they served their country with valor and with honor, and they paid the ultimate price. And so we do that. And who are these people? Well, they're gone now. But they're guys like, remember Bob Durst used to sit in the back of the yeah. church? Mm -hmm. yeah. Bob Durst, uh, when I went to college, when I graduated from high school, I went to a 
what would would have been a four-year party, but it ended up being a one-year party, and then a year of suspension, and then another few months of party, and then out into the real world. When Bob Durst graduated from high school, he got a plane and flew over to Europe, and was plunked down into a machine gun nest, where he's shooting across these hill. This he's on one side of a hill and he's shooting over here at these people over here on the other side. And of course, when they know that there's a machine gun, machine gun nest here, that's prime target. That's the first thing they want to blow up. And this 18-year-old Bob Durst, who's just like you and I were when we were 18 years old, just a kid doing what? Out to save the world from communism? Out to save the world from, you know, Hitler and his men? Oh, we, we hear all those stories and we deplore them. And maybe in a rush of patriotism, we would enter into the thing. But in a very short while, you find out how de desperately high a price you're paying to defend our way of life, to make sure that we have the freedoms that we have and that we enjoy and that so much of the world has never, ever enjoyed. And when they go there to pay this price, again, some of them never come home. And that means your son, who you watch grow up with the little curly hair, or maybe he had straight black hair, little kid with freckles, playing with a garden hose, and next thing you know, he's overseas, and he's being what? shot to death, uh, burned to death with napalm or something like that, or maybe they dropped a bomb on it, or maybe they blow up a whole little uh, encampment here with a couple of grenades. <coughs> or is the most horrible and ugly thing, perhaps, in the whole world? And here's the thing about it. If you ever wanted to know where God was, You'd ask about that. Oh, it's, there was a school shooting recently, right? Any, any one of them, nine kids die, maybe 20 kids. And it's tragic and horrible, isn't it? It really is. How about thousands? How about by the thousands? Young people going overseas to fight each other to die. And what for? often because leaders, okay, get caught up in what? Sometimes a macho contest. In political banter and gamesmanship and challenges. And you can't be seen to be weak. You can't be seen to back down. You can't be seen to not believe in what you're doing. So sometimes you plunge your head at the expense of all these others. That's a horrible world we live in. You talk about a curse on this world, that is an absolutely horrible thing. And it's so fascinating when you read about it in the Bible. Listen to what Moses wrote to the nation of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 20. When you go out to war against your enemies, not if, See, the Bible takes things really as they are. The Bible addresses the real world we live in. This isn't a book of fairy tales where, like in ancient Roman mystical belief, they believed if we give the right sacrifices to the right gods and give them enough, then we can change the omens. In other words, change the signs that they give and then we can get what we want. If we just pacify the gods with the proper things, right? And when we're busy pacifying, those guys over on the other side, they're busy pacifying. And when the smoke clears, when you go to war against your enemies, because it's gonna happen, it's a part of life. They lived in what they called a warrior culture back in ancient days. In a warrior culture, the war never really stopped. You remember what happened to King David when he got in trouble with Bathsheba? 
Remember what the opening of the story was? It said, at the time when kings go out to war, David stayed home this time. So now he's got time on his hands, time to walk around the roof and wonder what's going on and, hey, what's that going on down there? Now he's got something to occupy his time. By his cultural standards, he should have been out at war. Leading his enemies, leading his armies to kill their enemies. Because we live in a world where there really are enemies. And there really is hate. And there really is destruction. And there really is satanic, brutal, brutal <coughs> malicious activity. And so if you ever wanted to know how ugly life is without God, that's what war is. But see, God is doing it right. God is doing this right. He has given us free will. And he is so committed to that free will that he lets us live in an environment where this is the order of the day. Where your sons and daughters sometimes and sooner or later will be called to go to war. Whether you believe in it, whether you like it, whatever your political party, whatever this case may be, sooner or later they will be called to go to war. And some generation will watch a huge portion of the young people just destroyed and chopped up. You know, in the Bible we read about uh, one war situation where uh, uh, Saul was still king. And uh, I believe it was the Philistines attacked one of the cities of Jerusalem, of Israel. And so he took the body of one of the people, one of the young girl, chopped her into 12 pieces, and shipped those 12 pieces to all the 12 tribes of Israel, and said, this is what's going on. This is why we're going to war. We're not just going to try and get somebody else's property. We're not going to try and get somebody else's wealth. This is the real world we live in. And if we don't go to war, and if we don't fight back, this is what happens to our people by people who really don't love or honor God. And in fact, he goes on in this very passage. He says, uh, when you draw near to a town to fight against it, offer it terms of peace. But if it accepts your terms of peace and surrenders to you, then all the people in it shall be your forced labor. And if it doesn't submit to you peaceably, but makes war against it, you shall besiege it, God says in his word. And when the Lord your God gives it into your hand, not when you take it, when God goes to fight for you and gives it into your hand, you shall put all its males to the sword. You kill all their males. And then, you may however take as your booty the women the children, the livestock, and everything else in the town, all its spoil, which the Lord your God has given you. Thus you shall treat all the towns that are very far from you, which are not towns of the nations here. But as for the towns of the peoples that the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance, you must not let anything that breathes remain alive. You shall annihilate them, the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded, so that they may not teach you to do all the abhorrent things that they do for their gods. And you thus sin against the Lord your God. So if you ever thought that this was not a book of real life, God says, look, the whole purpose of telling you the story about fixing the window, God's fixing this world the right way. And a part of that is for us to come to an understanding that you don't want to live the life you're living right now. We don't want to live forever in this condition. We are so used to it, we don't think anything about it. And we read passages like this, and occasionally somebody might say, well, I can't believe God would have 
advocate that, I would think he'd be a pacifist. But you know, when the soldiers came to Jesus, you know what he told them? They came and says, hey, we're here to repent. Or excuse me, they came to John the Baptist. We're here to repent. We want to know what it means to follow God. And John the Baptist, you know what he said? He didn't say, lay down your swords. He just said, don't take advantage of your authority. Be content with your salary, okay? And don't shake people down and don't threaten and intimidate and take advantage of the poor, regular old people, okay? But you need it. And the Apostle Paul wrote, and said by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that God has not given the sword in vain to governments, but rather to keep evil on a lower keel. If the sword was removed, if law enforcement was removed, if armies are removed, what would happen? The bullies and the greedy and the evil would just eat everybody's lunch and take what they want and have no resistance. That the world we really want to live in? And that's why God went to the extent to send his son to die for our sins. We need to be set free from this. And guess what? Deuteronomy, how many thousands of years ago is that? And it still goes on. You're talking about this war over in the Ukraine, right? We don't even put it in the paper anymore. How many people died last week between Russia and the Ukraine? Nobody has any idea. They don't even know what's going on. They don't cover it. Because it's not interesting. It's not new. It's not sexy. It's not uh, something to catch the eye. Is that the world we want to live in forever? And so the Lord says, look, we're going to have a kingdom. And it's going to be eternal. And only the just are going to be a part of it. And the only way any man, woman, or child will ever be just is by the grace, mercy, forgiveness, and cleansing that only God can provide. You can't fight your way out of this. The war goes on forever. Talking over here, somebody said, they're so sick of watching politicians of both sides. The individual said, I, I see one individual come on TV and I want to punch him right in the face. Right? Right. I feel that way <laughs> about different people than that person who I'm talking about. <laughs> but you get the point. It just never ends. Back in the day, I mean, oh, we've never had such incivility in our country. Yet back in the 1800s, a man was caned nearly to death in Congress where one of the congressmen took his cane, walked down the aisle, and beat him about the head until he was bloody, battered, and laying on the floor. That hasn't happened in the last couple weeks down there. <laughs> now we Twitter after each other. Now we uh, TikTok, or whatever the order of the day is. And we say back and forth, and they say back and forth, and then they go and check the stock profiles <laughs> Because they're all making $174,000 a year. And within two or three years, they're millionaires. Somehow, it works out for them. And then they go, and when they go to eat dinner, they don't go to Cracker Barrel. They don't go to Bob Evans. They don't go to Burger King. They go to the place where there's at least four little dollar signs on TripAdvisor, and maybe five. And they live like kings. And they wear the finest clothes and the finest things. And their kids get out of war all the time. They get deferments. They get special consideration. But John Q. Public sitting in pews like yours all over America watch their kids go and pay the ultimate price. You want to live in the world like that forever? No. You want your window to work properly? got to go through the whole process and God says we are going to destroy the power of evil so that in my kingdom it never ever ever raises its head again and I'm willing to pay and you'll all pay the price it's going to rain on the just and the unjust okay? 
There is a price for every one of us. That we will all take up our cross and follow him or we will not enter into that kingdom. We will all sacrifice. We will all surrender. And we will do it in the name of God. And we will do it by the power of the Spirit of God. And we'll do what we're to do. But God doesn't say, good, once you've done that, then I'll let you in. No, he says, this is going to cost way more than that. That's just an indication that you have been transformed by my spirit. I will send my son on your behalf that you might be set free from sin. Because the only way out of this <coughs> world where God help us. How about our prayer list again this morning? I mean, people we know and love and have taken care of their families and been sincere and honest their whole lives are struggling for their lives or struggling for the life of a little child right who never did anything wrong who mom and dad really never did anything really wrong okay but this is the world we live in this is the world of the curse and if we're ever going to get set free from it it's only by the power and grace of god yeah when you go to war and find out how horrible and ugly it is. You know, the book of uh, the Iliad, right? Remember Homer's Iliad? And it's all about the war to take Troy. And it all started because <laughs> uh, Bless you. a man stole a king's wife, Helen of Troy. He stole her wife his wife and brought her to Troy and they get together this big party to go and bring her back and on the way there they offend the gods and they offend the priest but when it finally comes to it and they go to war you know Homer is so descriptive and he talks about somebody chasing down another guy and he puts his spear through the back of his head and the spear comes out through the front of the head, and cuts his tongue off at the root, smashes his teeth out, and then he falls down to the ground in a heap of black death, right? We read about that, and we just read it and move on to the next paragraph. But that's the real tor terror of war. That's how ugly war really is. And that's how ugly this world really is. And that's how immune we become to the situation we're in. We need the grace and mercy of God to show us the situation we're in, to convince us that we're lost and hopeless. That's why he leaves us in this world we're in. That's why we're in this curse. So when people say, well, why would God do this? God would do this, what? Only for the very best of reasons. He only does what's good. He only does what's right. He only does what's just. And when we think, oh, God didn't answer our prayers, it's because the very best thing that could ever happen to you is that he didn't answer that prayer. It's because the very best thing that could ever happen to you is that he's doing something different than from our lights, what looks like the only intelligent solution to this problem, the only workable solution to this problem is to do X, Y, or Z, and God comes and says, no, that won't solve the problem at all. I have so much higher for you. I have so much more for you. I want to spend eternity with you, but I don't want sin in the way. And I don't want a fractured and violated relationship with you ever again. And I don't want in my kingdom ever again wars or rumors of wars. I want in my kingdom a place where there's no tears, where there's no sickness, where there's no suffering, where there's no pain, where the only talk of those things might be when we look at the redemptive grace and love of Jesus Christ <laughs> and melt to the floor or of heaven itself in thanksgiving that he should give so much for us who are so unworthy. So, Memorial Day. What a conundrum. We celebrate fallen heroes. We thank God for this country, and we do. We do. We thank God that we're a part of this fabulous world he's created. But we're 
rudely reminded and rudely awakened to the fact that we need salvation, we need to be set free, and we found through what? How many thousands of years of history that hatred won't solve the problem, war won't solve the problem, incredible wealth won't solve the problem, tremendous prosperity won't solve the problem. The only solution there is in this universe is that the God of heaven and earth should forgive his people and they should thank him forever for setting them free from the root cause of all this evil, which is sin. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your holy word. Because again, Lord, we have become so immune and so blinded to the ugliness of the curse of this world. We just accept it as, like it says in Moses' words, you know, when you go to war, and we just accept it, because it is part of life. It's nothing that we could ever see would ever change. And we don't say, you know what, we better quit building hospitals because it's gonna be a great big turnaround and we're not gonna need these hospitals anymore. No, as far as we can see down here in this world until something changes, we need to keep building better, more technologically excellent, more efficient, better houses of healing because it's a part of the order of the day. And so we cry out, Lord Jesus, come soon. Set us free from this world of sickness, suffering, tears, sorrow, separation, bitterness, and death. And deliver us to the eternal things of God. Lord, would you call to yourself people and bring us home. We'll thank you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, let's turn to 486. Let's all stand as we sing.
we can get our business done by 11.30 and then have Sunday school and trustees be done for the day. So trustees, let's go right to our room as soon as, this, as, soon as I pray and uh, we'll do our doing and Sunday school will gather as usual and I'll be out there at, at 11.26. <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer. Great. Father, thank you for this day and the blessings of it. Again, for the privilege of being a part of your kingdom. Thank you so much for bringing us together here. And our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word. This isn't some pie in the sky book. This isn't some, you know, wishful thinking, oh, everything's a feather bed, right? This is a real world book that really tells us about a real curse that really is on this world and about the ugliness and power of sin. We see it in our lives, but we don't always realize what it is. But it's the result of us being separated from you. And the only solution is to reunite with the God of mercy and grace and be filled with that same Holy Spirit. So Father, would you come upon us and speak to our hearts about all these things? We'll be thankful forever in Jesus' name.